Hi, and welcome to Open, the show that opens the Bronx and the rest of the world to you. I'm Kim and Aline, and today we'll update you on what's happening in and around our borough. Coming up, each year, nearly 500 New Yorkers die because an organ does not come in time to save their lives. The Chief of Division of Transplantation and Director of Abdominal Transplantation at Montefiore Health System joins us to discuss National Donate Life Month. Then this year's NCAA and WNBA draft further highlighted the gender pay gap between male and female athletes. We speak with a business and sports attorney to discuss solutions to this inequality in professional sports. After that, the Enchanted Garden Affirmation Coloring Book prioritizes mental health as it takes children and adults on a positive mental health journey with the help of daily affirmations. Today, the author joins us in studio to discuss its benefits. And finally, the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council has been a champion for independent artists in New York City since 1973. Their primary goal is to serve, connect, and make space for artists in the community. Today, we'll speak with the president of the council to further discuss their overall mission. So stay tuned. All this and much more is headed your way because we're now officially open. Hello everyone, I'm Kim and Aline and today is Tuesday, April 30th. You are now watching Open, a program that brings the Bronx and New York City straight to you. Don't forget to stay connected with us via social media at BronxNet TV. April is National Donate Life Month, a time to recognize and honor those who have saved lives through organ donations. In New York City alone, almost 8,000 people currently wait for these life-saving donations. Dr. Milan Kinkabwala, Chief of the Division of Transplantation and Director of Abdominal Transplantation at Montefiore Health System, joined me to discuss the critical importance of these donations. Doctor, thank you so much for joining me. Now, can you tell me more about Montefiore's history with organ donation? Sure. So we've been a proud uh, member of uh, the community in the Bronx since 1967. So we were actually one of the first transplant centers in the world uh, to perform transplants, and we've been continuously performing transplants since then. So more than four decades now, uh, we've been involved in both kidney transplant as well as liver transplant, and we now have a heart and lung transplant program as well. So very comprehensive uh, set of, uh, uh, of uh, operations that we perform for the community. Thank you. And I know you mentioned a few of them. Can you just quickly tell us, I only, I mentioned just organ um, donations, but I understand there's a little bit more to that. So can you just clarify that for me? Yeah. So there's two types of organ donation. So when we perform transplants, solid organ transplants, like kidney, for example, um, those organs can come from two sources. One could be deceased donors, which are uh, people in the community, uh, hospitals that may pass, uh, usually because of a neurologic problem like a stroke or trauma, and then they or their family members uh, consent to organ donation. Um, that's the most common way uh, transplants are performed. But there's also living donation, which is particularly important for kidney donors, for kidney recipients. About half of the kidney transplants performed in the US are actually from living donors, where a friend, family member, or even someone unrelated uh, may come forward and offer to donate their organ for someone in need on the waiting list. So these two types of organ donation are the way that transplants are performed in the United States. Um, and it's available uh, here in our center. Uh, we've been doing living donors now for, again, uh, 30, 40 years. So it's an important uh, component of our practice. Uh, and we have been very uh, active in promoting deceased donation in the community as well to increase awareness around um, uh, being an organ donor uh, and, uh, for both community uh, uh, centers as well as for patients who come in the hospital. Now, can you talk about National Donate Life Month and the impact it's had on the healthcare industry? Well, it's wonderful that we have this uh, Donate Life, Life Month because there's such a need nationally, especially in New York and also in the Bronx, uh, for people that are waiting for organ transplants that uh, have been waiting a long time and have a significant need 
uh, to obtain an organ before they get too sick. So having this Donate Life Month, which has been going on a long time, uh, it's a national Donate Life Month to raise awareness uh, in the United States around the need for organ donation uh, so that people in the community uh, may uh, come forward and potentially sign their donor card or sign on online on the registry so that they can be organ donors. Now, I want to highlight the importance of donating. I know for a lot of people, uh, just the idea of it can be scary or a lot of people just don't know that much about it. Can you just explain a little bit more about, you know, just the overall importance of this act? Yeah, so this is a selfless act. Uh, you know, when you're a deceased donor, you are uh, offering a part of yourself to help restore life in someone that you may not know. So I think this is an act of altruism, uh, generosity, and selflessness. Um, there's no barrier from a religious standpoint or from a medical standpoint to donating organs or tissues. This has been clarified by all the churches, synagogues, and other uh, religious leaders in the community as being important to participate in if you're um, a citizen or a member of the community. So I think that um, you know, it's an act of generosity. You're helping save another life. Uh, and I think, um, you know, there's a lot of interest in this. Uh, and we're trying to make it easier for people to, to register to donate so that there's no obstacle in their mind that if they do pass, uh, then both uh, they've declared themselves as potential donors and they've also told their families that they want to be an organ donor so that if it does happen, uh, God forbid, that they're able to actually turn that tragedy into something very positive by being able to help uh, someone else in need. Now, there are almost 8,000 New Yorkers who need a life-saving organ transplant. You know, just off the top of my head, thinking about all of the health disparities that we have here in the Bronx and, you know, across New York, you know, can you just highlight the extreme need for org organ donations in New York City? Yeah, so uh, New York is a, is a, and the Bronx in particular, are communities where there's a lot of patients that have different diseases that lead to organ failure. So diabetes, for example, is very prevalent in our community. Hypertension is prevalent in our community. This leads to all kinds of conditions like cardiac, cardiac disease, kidney disease, liver disease. And these are the things that ultimately in some patients lead to organ failure where they need an organ transplant. So because there's a lot of prevalence of some of these underlying conditions in our community, um, we have a higher rate of patients that are waiting for organ transplants in New York, say, compared to some other parts of the country where um, the population may be generally, maybe potentially healthier. So because of that situation, we have a dire need in New York for organ donors because we have a lot of patients on the list. As you mentioned, 8,000 is close to 100,000 nationally. So we have a huge gap uh, in the availability of organs, but particularly in our community, where um, we're trying to get the Bronx community to be aware of this particular need with, uh, with uh, neighbors in our, in our own community that really would benefit from having a community support through organ donation uh, so we can address some of the disparities that we know exist in organ transplantation like it does in every aspect of healthcare. Now, what are the most common life-saving organ donations? And with that, you know, are there any challenges um, in regard to that? Yes, so the most common uh, type of organ donation, as I mentioned, is deceased donors. So what happens in a deceased donor donation is, is that a patient will come to the hospital, um, and I, as I mentioned, usually the condition is a neurologic condition, like a stroke, uh, but it could be a trauma, for example, that results in a condition called brain death. So brain death is a particular medical condition, and it's legal as well as medically approved where um, the brain is no longer viable. That means the brain, the soul has passed and the brain is no longer uh, alive, but the heart is still alive because through our life support mechanisms, we're able to continue to provide life support to keep the organs functioning, even though the patient's brain is passed. So in that situation, we're able to remove the organs if the patient consented or if the family consents. And that's a surgical procedure we do in the hospital. So. If a patient passes and they have, they're declared brain dead by their doctors, then um, we would take the patient to the operating room in order to remove the organs that they consented for. And it doesn't always have to be organs. It can also be tissue like skin, corneas, which are used for eyes, um, 
cartilage and valves which are used for heart patients. So it's not only organs per se, it could also be other types of tissues that are donated. Now, what are some common misconceptions about this entire just donation, like organ donation in general? Oh, there's a lot of misconceptions uh, just because it's a very mysterious process for most people. You know, how do you take an organ out of someone and put it in someone else? But we're trying to demystify it. And I think it's very important to gain the trust of the public that um, the organ transplant community is separate from the, pa the, the, the team of doctors that are taking care of any individual patient in the hospital. So we're not involved in making decisions about whether um, uh, someone is declared brain dead or not. That's their patient's own doctor. And if the patient is declared brain dead, only then do we get involved as an organ transplant community to try and uh, help the family uh, obtain some resolution of their grief, grief by potentially donating. So I think there's a lot of misconception around the idea that uh, somehow by being an organ donor, uh, the patient would not be treated the same way as someone who's not an organ donor because we're trying to obtain their organs, for example, before they're actually dead. That never happens. So um, we only wait until the patients are declared dead by their own doctors, and if the patients have consented, then only then would we be eligible to go in and potentially uh, use some of those organs for our transplant patients. Now, this is really important, so I wanted to highlight it. One organ donor can save up to eight lives, which when you put it in that perspective, it's, you yeah. know, it's very, uh, it's like, it's just a lot to, you know, take in that, like, yeah, one person dramatic. could save so many people. So right. can you just expand on that a little bit more? Yeah, so when you donate an organ, it, it's not only one organ. So depending on the health of the donor, uh, donors can donate a heart, two lungs, two kidneys, a liver, as well as tissues such as, as I mentioned, skin, corneas, valves. So you're talking about a lot of potential patients that can be impacted, uh, people that are waiting uh, by a single organ donor. And that's why it's so important for people to understand that by being an organ donor, you're really impacting a large group of people. Uh, and if you pay it forward, you can imagine the amount of uh, people that are, that are positively affected by being an organ donor. Uh, you know, you could save somebody's life, but in turn, take that person's life that you saved and help their family. So it really has a, a magnifying effect uh, in terms of helping the community when you donate. Now, what are the steps needed for organ donation and who would be a right fit for organ, organ donation? Well, right now, I think anybody that is um, either wants to be a live donor, um, they can certainly approach any of the transplant centers in New York. Um, and they have programs in which live donors that may want to donate to somebody, either they know or they don't know, can be carefully screened and undergo an education process um, if they want to proceed with uh, being a living donor. And this would be primarily for kidney uh, or also liver transplants. <clears throat> but for deceased donors, the most important thing is that everyone in the community should declare themselves as willing to be a living donor, either through their li driver's license but if they don't have a driver's license, it's not a requirement. You can go online and uh, register at donatelife.org, uh, where you can register to be an organ donor uh, on the National Organ Donor Registry. And this will be recorded so that if, uh, if it ever comes to pass that you do become a donor, then we know what your wishes are. Uh, and then the teams can, can, uh, can move uh, forward appropriately. Well, doctor, I want to thank you so much. I think this is an important conversation to have. Um, as you mentioned, there is a lot of mystery around this, especially in communities like the Bronx, where a lot of people have a, little, a lot of mistrust when it comes yes. to certain procedures. So I think it's so important that we were able to have this discussion um, and kind of talk about it. And as you mentioned, yeah. demystify, you know, the yes. act of organ donations. So thank you yes. so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. To learn more about the Montefiore Einstein Center for Transplantation, please go to the website on the screen below. Don't go away, we'll be back with more open after this.
Without Bronx Net, I don't know how we'd be able to showcase the important and amazing talents that we have here at the Bronx. We've been able to feature lots of great artists, performers, people who deal with coffee and small entrepreneurship businesses, discuss controversial topics, and also be able to share the voice of residents that might not normally have access without a place like BronxNet. Welcome back. College basketball and WNBA stars like Angel Reese, Camila Cordoso, and Caitlin Clark helped women's basketball garner over 20 million views, making it the first time women's basketball surpassed men's basketball in viewership. However, the gender pay gap remains the same, with female athletes receiving much less compared to their male counterparts. Business and sports attorney Savonia DeBarros joins me to discuss what athletes can do to combat this. Savonia, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Now, as I mentioned, you identify as someone who protects athletes, you know, as an attorney. How are you exercising this currently with women's basketball? Well, through my personal brand, I'm known as the protector of athletes. Um, my trade is the law. So as an attorney, everything that I do is helping athletes to understand and recognize what their brand is. And so there are several ways that I do this. One, through education, through education with my law firm, SL DeBarros Law Firm, through Athletes Making Moves and our sister brand, NIL Combine, which is a conference to educate athletes and anyone who calls themselves an athlete advocate around name, image, and likeness and deal making um, and relationships, all those things that pretty much make up the athlete that supports the athlete that helps them to build and maintain businesses, but also through publications that I've written, um, specifically two of them, Athletes Making Moves and What Are You Sporting About? And so these are ways that I am helping women athletes, um, also their male counterparts. And, you know, I'm, I'm just super excited to talk more about this subject because we do need more attention on women athletes and especially our female basketball players. Now, I'm really glad to admit that I'm one of those people that started watching women's basketball with some of the stars that I mentioned. Um, but I was really surprised to hear, you know, some of the numbers that were coming out, um, which kind of highlighted that that gender pay gap. Can you give us a little background on the gender pay gap for professional, you know, athletes specifically in basketball? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, Caitlin Clark has been tearing up the Internet, right, uh, with her amazing gameplay, but then also being number one draft pick for the WNBA. Well, her salary is, what, $338,000 over four years. So once we start taking out taxes and agent fees, what is she really walking away with? Maybe $50,000, maybe $60,000. And so it, it kind of provides this idea that if you're a woman and you go pro, in a sport that's just as hard as a, a male sport, you still won't be paid what you're worth. But then when we look at other athletes, specifically male athletes at the NBA level, their starting salaries are in the millions. And let me just give you a little color, all right? So Caitlin Clark uh, signed at $338,000 for four years, 2023 Aaliyah Boston at $233,000 at three years. So when we look at 2023 draft pick for Victor, I don't want to mess up his, main, his name. I think it's uh, Wimbenyama. He went to the Spurs. His signing contract was $55.2 million. All right, 2022, Paolo Banchero, he went to Orlando Magic, and his starting salary was 50000 I mean, I'm sorry, $50 million over four years. So when we look at just the last few years, and NBA uh, draft has not come yet for 2024, that'll be in June, women are not even making a 1% of what their male counterparts are making in the exact type of sport. And so this is not something that's new. It is something that has existed for a long time, and it also exists in other industries. And it is time for us to really call it out for what it is it, it doesn't make sense in reality or in business or based around gender for women to work just as hard as men to only receive a fraction, if that, you know, literally a drop in the bucket of what their male counterparts receive. 
Now, considering women's basketball, you know, as I mentioned, college basketball and the WNBA draft drew in a larger audience this year. What message could the continued pay gap send to female athletes, uh, their coaches, their, you know, their parents um, and everyone in their team? Yes, I'm a former athlete myself, right? I didn't go pro. I was a track athlete. But for me, that messaging says it doesn't matter how hard you work. It doesn't matter how well you compete. It doesn't matter how well you show up as an entrepreneur. You know, it doesn't matter how many NIL deals that you go out there and, and you can secure for yourself. You're not worth the same pay. And it's it's sad. You know, I'm going to talk a little bit about the commissioner's statements, and I don't want to take her message out of context because I only saw a portion of what she shared with uh, CNBC. But when she was talking about Caitlin Clark's uh contract with WNBA, she was talking about, you know, well, she's going to get the opportunity to, to get endorsements, to get all of these things that aren't part of the original contract, right? And male athletes do not have to necessarily worry about having to go and find a sponsorship, go and find a, uh, a an endorsement that is going to help them, you know, that's going to pay them properly for their time and their sacrifice that they put into the sport. And so for women athletes, yeah, it just paints a picture that we're not good enough. We're not good enough to be paid the same or better than what our male athletes are being paid. Right. And, that, and I love that you kind of put it in that perspective because it shows that uh, you kind of have to do two jobs. You have to be an athlete and I mean, I don't want to say celebrity because, it, it, you know, I could see where people think it's the same. Uh, but you have to do two jobs just to make maybe a fraction of what male athletes are making. So thank you so much for pointing that out. Now, to combat this, you advocate for many of these athletes to maximize their potential. Can you expand on how athletes can actually do this? Absolutely. Not getting pigeonholed into just being an athlete, just focusing on your sport. There's so many different things that make up an, an individual, makes up who you are, you know? So educating yourself, educating yourself on entrepreneurship, um, networking, how to build real relationships, your money habits, finance, uh, the importance of how legal falls into things. Like, what do you have a right over? Don't just go and sign a deal just because it looks good. What benefit does it have for me? You know, also building community, building community with people who can support you uh, in ways where maybe they will they will provide their support and their expertise to you at no charge because you have built that interpersonal relationship with them. Working on your communication, get better communication skills verbally and in writing. Build that self awareness too to understand when when you mess up. All right, how can I fix it? And that also goes into that that moral character of who you are. People want to work with folks who they feel like they can really support, who are grateful, you know, so showing that gratitude as well, but also creating your own brand and being aware that you do have a personal brand. It does not matter uh, whether you have a business that you are monetizing right now. Someone knows you because of a particular reason. Maybe it was something that you said, maybe it was something that you did, maybe it's the way that you walk into a room or how you dress. And so you have your own personal brand. And these are ways that athletes can start looking at these different uh, parts or characteristics of who they are to maximize the opportunities that they have. And I wanna draw something out for you really quick because Caitlin Clark did this, Angel Reese did this. There's so many athletes now in the era of name, image, and likeness who have been able to capitalize off of the brands that they've created, whether it's their name as a personal brand or uh, something else like products or a form of business. You know, Caitlin Clark has multiple deals. Uh, a notable deal is with Nike. Angel Reese, she has multiple deals. Uh, in college, she graced the cover of Sports Illustrated, sponsorship of Mercedes-Benz. And, and when the championship was playing, uh, Miel hair products was on almost every commercial. She's in that commercial as well. And so these are all ways that athletes can build uh, their brand, but also maximize on any opportunities that they have before they go pro. Now, there is an emphasis on parent involvement. Can you explain the importance of having parents involved in this journey? Yeah, parents are becoming increasingly more aware that name, image, and likeness exist. <laughs> um, they have always been aware that 
especially if their child showed signs of stardom in sports, there's a possibility that my child could go pro. However, with name, image, and likeness being in the collegiate space now, although parents understand, well, uh, they know what it is. They don't necessarily understand the ins and outs of name, image, and likeness. They don't really understand the legality around it. They don't understand the finance, uh, the financial issues around it. And it takes my mind to an issue that happened with a college student, Gervon Dexter, who played for UF, went pro to the NFL and signed a contract that was detrimental to him, giving uh, this company 15% of his NFL earnings for 25 years. And so as an advocate for your child and as an advocate inside of the NIL space, collectively, the parents and that that student athletes should be learning together, should be having open dialogues about what they believe can truly benefit the student, but also thinking long term, you may think that this is a good deal, but think about this, all right? If X happens, how would you feel? And we need to start having those deeper conversations so that our children can learn and think about their brands and, and sustainability long-term versus what they believe would be a quick and happy payout, but only to suffer later. Now, I want to bring it back to the women uh, that we talked about, as you mentioned, uh, Angel Reese, Caitlin Clark. Uh, a lot of people will say, well, the reason why they're paid the way they are is because, uh, you know, WNBA doesn't have as many supporters. What can, you know, viewers who are going to watch these women, you know, play this sport do to further support these athletes to ensure that they gain what they actually deserve? Absolutely. Let me speak to that question from two folds, right? One as a professional and then one just, you know, as a viewer of the sport. As a viewer of the sport, engage with that athlete, go to their games, buy the merchandise, try to find other ways that you can give to that sport to help uplift women's athletics, but also to drive and bring more revenue into the sport. As a professional, if you're able to make any business uh, with the WNBA, see if there's a way that you can partner to bring more capital into the sport. Um, also, bring them on to your conferences. You know, it, are there any opportunities to have collaboration with female athletes? Because we already know that they're going to have to go and do, you know, triple time the work just to get to 1% of what their male counterparts are being paid. And so we need to put forth a lot more effort to show these women that we we value them, we know that they are well-deserving, and do what we can as professionals and or viewers to go and to truly support them and bring the dollars into those games. Well, I want to thank you so much for having this really interesting conversation. As I mentioned, I was viewing this, uh, you know, with many other people, so I'm so glad we were able to talk about this and learn what we can do to support these athletes. So thank you so much. Thank you. To learn more about the work Savonia does, please go to the website www.athletesmakingmoves.com. Stay tuned, we have more for you right after this. Thank you, Bronx Ned. Congratulations on 30 years. What an amazing accomplishment. On behalf of myself, Alina Dow, and I represent the Dow Twins and the Dow Twins Show, who are young producers. They are. They started, I think, when they were 11, and now they're 14. They started making 30-second little fun facts, and now they are doing 30-minute shows. And it goes to a testament of how much you guys do in the Bronx to make young people want to continue to be involved. I wish you 30 more amazing years and beyond. Thank you for what you do. Seven percent of New York City high school students are college ready by their senior year. Fifty-five percent of high school graduates either have no plans to attend college or are uncertain that they will ever attend. Thirty-four percent of young adults don't go to college because they can't afford it. 
discover what's possible. BronxNet's education programs, internships, and opportunities help engage and inspire Bronx youth and beyond to pursue their passions. Be a part of the BronxNet family. Whether you're interested in our shows, joining a class, or donating to support our mission, visit BronxNet.org to learn more. Welcome back. With a mission to help people on their journey with prioritizing mental health, Mercedes Osakwe created the Enchanted Garden Affirmation Coloring Book. The mindfulness book guides children and adults as they overcome the challenges of self-esteem issues and self-doubt with daily affirmations. The author of The Creative Outlet now joins me to discuss the benefits. Mercedes, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. Now, uh, when learning a little bit more about you, I understand that you wear many hats, um, and one of them is becoming a therapy doctoral student, correct? Yes, so I'm basically an occupational therapy doctoral student, yeah. Okay, now, how did this journey begin for you? Can you tell us a little bit more about that background? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, when I was younger, my mother got injured, and she was um, basically taken to a nearby hospital, and she had to work closely with OTs, occupational therapists, PTs, physical therapists, and so on and so forth, and nurses, and she would go there to Two to three times a week to work with OTs and I just love how they work with her how diligent they were how soft and kind and how they also used a lot of their creativity to help her with a lot of adaptive skills helping her with her injury and and help her overcome them so it really inspired me and I was like oh my gosh like I want to be an OT like I like what they're doing um, I like the hours <laughs> I like that they're able to like help others and help people back on their feet so I was really inspired by that. Now, how has that journey impacted your work now as an author? So right now as an author, um, currently, like, I'm just, this is my first ever book. Um, basically, like, that has impacted me in many ways because it showed me that to be authentically myself, use my creativity to help others, um, pour into others, um, use what I've learned um, seeing in school and out of school to work with other people. Also, too, like, being in school has taught me, I've worked in other communities, like, with a mental health, um, a sensory playground, sensory gyms. Uh, I've worked in adult daycares with people with Alzheimer's and de dementia and using a science evidence-based articles and using my creativity to make interventions and sessions that help others to over for their overall quality of life and to help them um, just be better and reach their goals. That's what occupational therapies do. Like we help people reach what's meaningful, help them achieve goals that are meaningful to them. Now, what inspired the creation of the Enchanted Garden Affirmation Coloring Book? Which, by the way, I just love the way it sounds. I love coloring books in general. So what inspired the creation of this? So what inspired the creation of my book is uh, mental health is very, very important to me. Um, your mental health, your overall well-being, and just making sure that, like, encouraging yourself, using these words in my book to, as chants, you know, every day. Like, you know, you wake up every morning, you use it. And that kind of made me realize that, I need that too, right? Like that's something that we need daily as individuals. So using my creativity, using that side of me that wants to give back made encourage me to want to make a coloring book. And I also just love coloring. I love gardens. I love plants. I love animals. Just being in nature is just therapeutic in general. Now, I also want to highlight, you know, when people think coloring, they automatically think it's something for children. Uh, but I feel like lately, we've be, as a society, we've become more open with um, finding new ways to express ourselves and kind of being open with that. You know, what are the health benefits of coloring and expressing yourself creatively? Yeah, so coloring and expressing yourself creatively, it opens up different parts of your mind, uh, your subconscious and your conscious, your conscious part of your mind. It helps you to be more elaborate. It helps you to be more intentional. Um, it boosts your self-esteem, your confidence confidence and lowers your anxiety. It helps you with your everyday, uh, some people have everyday struggles, so they need that encouragement. They need that constant, those constant words. They need those pictures to visualize. You know, they say your brain is like a vessel, like your brain's like a sponge. So whatever we see, we eat it up and we apply it to our lives. Like, you know, like a lot of things that we see also socialize us to act a certain way. So why not make a book that will socialize you to increase your self-esteem, to increase your, your well-being and your, and your overall quality of life? Now, the book features affirmations on every page, which is a little bit what we talked about. Can you talk about the power of affirmations? Yeah, so the power of affirmations, like, there's so many there's so many amazing things about affirmations. Um, one thing about affirmations is that it brings you closer to who you really want to be. It's a way to advocate for yourself. It's a way to boost up your confidence. It's a way to 
uh, pour into yourself. It's like going through a self-love journey. Um, is a way to have more self-respect. Is a way to also, if you're spiritual, you know, some people who may be spiritual, it's like almost like talking to God, right? You know, they say your thoughts are your prayers because your thoughts go up. So it's like things of that sort. And affirmations, it's just a way to pour that love and that respect that you want for yourself and to yourself is a way to give yourself har har harmony, peace, and things of that sort. So, yeah. Now, I'm curious to know, um, because we're talking about affirmations, how did you come up with, you know, some of the things that you thought would be inspiring for people to see every day? And because they're coloring and it takes time, they're, you know, they're looking at this this quote or this um, this saying for, you know, it could be an hour, it could be a couple of minutes, you know, what went through your mind when it came to creating that? So when it came to creating, I kind of also incorpor incorporated myself, you know, incorporated what I was thinking at the time, what would make me happy and apply to others. As someone who considers herself as a healer, soon to be an occupational therapist, I wanted to make something that was also therapeutic, right? You know, this is very therapeutic. This is very helpful. It's uh, almost like a self-help book, right? Everyone has their different books that they read. So this is like a self-help book with illustrations, beautiful illustrations and beautiful words. So, um, yeah, so that was like basically a part of like my reason to do that. And then you, you mentioned therapeutic. How was it therapeutic for you creating the book? Yeah, so creating the book was very therapeutic, like coming up with different quotes. Um, one of the quotes of my, uh, one of my favorite quotes in my book is, the opportunities are endless, right? All opportunities come to you. I'm open-minded. Whatever I want comes into my life. What I desire is already mine. Abundance is my birthright. So these are like quotes in my book. And I chant these every day. I say this every single day. So it boosts up my self-esteem, especially as someone who's a student, has so much going on. And I'm also a content creator. I have all the things going on. It, um, it helps me relax. And it gives me like a sense of confidence, a sense of self-worth. Now, initially when learning about the book, I automatically, just because I guess, you know, I think of myself and how I like to, you know, uh, be creative. I thought the book was just for adults, uh, but I was pleasantly surprised to see that it's also for children. You know, can you talk about the importance of making it available for both children and adults? Yes. Yeah, so I wanted to create something that was everyone can use, right? And that can be a little bit iffy, but I wanted to create something that people can use on a daily basis. So uh, for, especially when it comes to the children aspect, like it's like, creating a book that people can use literally every single day. People can open up and read a quote and remember it and it sticks with them. So I wanted to create something that everyone all over the world can use, can utilize on a daily basis and that um, kind of has a certain aspect to it, like an educational aspect, um, aspect, a way to read, to write, to just like talk. These are kind of like talking to yourself. I know people may think that's like weird, but you are your best advocate. So to, this book also advocates for children and adults because Mental health is so important, and that applies to everyone. Right. So, yeah. And I can imagine, uh, I know we mentioned uh, children and adults, but also for teens, um, as they're on their developmental stage and how they feel about their self-worth um, and their confidence, I could imagine it also will have an impact on them. Were you able to get any feedback from maybe different people, maybe family, friends um, in different age groups uh, to see what their thoughts were on it? Absolutely. So one thing about my book, like, um, is that it's touched so many different people of all backgrounds, races, demographics, ages, and people have definitely came up to me. Like, I even just went to an event a, a while ago. There was this um, young girl, and she, like, bought my book, and she was like, I love your book. Um, it makes me feel beautiful. So I'm just like, oh, my gosh, like, I'm so happy that some, like, you know, a child, and then I met adults who love to color, and the first thing they say, I love the color of your book. I love the, um, the back of your book, because the back of my book also says, nature fuels your soul. Mm -hmm. So like, okay. yeah, stuff like that. So I've met people from all walks of life, even though I've only been an author for a year and some change. And I've gotten a lot of amazing feedback. Now, I understand the book may also help children with their personal growth and development. Can you tell me a little bit more about this? Because I thought it was uh, very cool to see. I mean, I don't know the right terms, but it actually helps like small children with their development. Can you expand on that? Yeah, especially like uh, as an occupational therapy doctoral student, like in school, we learn about um, different things like visual motor, visual perceptual, fine motor skills. So things like visual motor will help with um, and I eye-hand coordination, like writing, coloring, and stuff like that. And fine motor also helps with handwriting. So using this book, like I know some kids, like they probably just don't like looking at their test book, but don't like looking at just random books like math. So like, this is like kind of like, it has a fun aspect to it. Understanding that one of kids' main occupation that we learned as I learned as OT is fun. Fun, play, like, so incorporating that with an educational aspect, it helps children want to learn more. They become more interested. So it has those um, type of like skills 
skills, like the visual motor skills, the perceptual skills, the fine motor skills, that that's the educational, and also reading, right? Reading to um, building community with other children, build, making friends, like sitting around and like coloring with their friends, like getting to know each other. So it just a, it's just, just a holistic experience using my book. Now, what do you hope to see for the future of the Affirmation Coloring Book? So as I see so many things <laughs> for the future of my book, um, and I'm just so grateful to God and also the people who have been supporting me. So I want my book to reach people all over the world. I want this book to be a way to advocate for mental health. I want to show people that this is a way to prioritize their mental health. Reading, writing, coloring, journaling, exercising, you know, pouring into yourself is one of the best things you can do. Self-care is not selfish, and we should all encourage ourselves to engage in things that keep us whole, keep us ground, keep our self-worth and our confidence high, and you just keep pouring into yourself. And I really wanted to do that because I I'm a big advocate about self-care. I'm a big advocate about pouring into yourself. So I hope that my book reaches people all over the world and it changed lives for the better. And, you know, I also want to add that, because um, you talked about fun, I, I don't think that, like, people often think when it comes to mental health care that it's always, like, super serious or, uh, like, facing trauma and there's, like, a lot of crying. But, like, it's also things that are peaceful and, um, you know, just kind of, like, getting in tune with yourself and kind of being creative. You know, is that something that you wanted to bring a little bit more to the mental health care side of, of everything? Yes, absolutely. I feel like also with my personality, I can be very fun, very bright, very open. And I feel like everything doesn't need to be black and white. Um, it's okay to shake things up a little bit, change it, make it colorful, make it just, you know, eye-catching, make it, I feel like too, we live in a world where like people want something different. People want something that that's eye-catching that they see and like, oh my gosh, what's that? I want that. And there's nothing wrong with having fun while you're also healing. There's nothing wrong with having fun while you're pouring into yourself. There's nothing wrong with, I feel like having fun is therapeutic, right? Like, um, I learned that from being around kids. Like, kids are having a lot of fun. Like, so, yeah, I feel like there should always be, to some level, like, a fun aspect in your life, like, whether you're an adult or not, because it can be healing. Right, and, and, I'm, and I'm so glad to see this. As I mentioned, I do a lot of coloring, um, and I will admit I need to find a little bit more time, that self-care aspect of it. Uh, but, you know, I think this is so important, and I'm glad to see that there's more people kind of, like, putting effort into this. So I want to thank you so much for joining us and sharing a little bit of you, you know, with our viewers. So thank you again. Thank you so much for having me. To learn more about Mercedes and the Enchanted Garden Affirmation Coloring Book, please go to the website on your screen below. We have to take a quick break. We'll be back with more open after this. Hello, my name is Tyrone Lowe. I host a show at Bronx Net called The Legends, where I bring real legends, DJs, upcoming artists, actually people from the past that was at, that's into entertainment. Um, I want to thank Bronx Net. First of all, I want to thank you know, I want to thank you know for the 30 years of of the actually being active here. It has opened a lot of doors for me to the point where I'm branching off to have my own network. Fulfill your dreams here. That's all I have to say. Hey everyone, it's your girl Kat from the Kitty Rose Lifestyle, also from the next chapter, where we discuss shades of gray every week right here at BronxNet, Saturdays at 11 p.m. Wow, 30 years, 30 years of BronxNet public access television. I'm a girl from Brooklyn and came to the Bronx 25 years ago, started my journey on BronxNet on public access television in 2016. And BronxNet is where I got my start. BronxNet, I feel like, is a home away from home. They support all of my endeavors, and I wouldn't have been able to be on any of the other channels if it wasn't for the fundamentals that I learned right here at my start here at BronxNet. So I am so appreciative. My son says I should stop telling people I'm from Brooklyn because I've been here now, Bronx Storm, for 22 years. So I'm so grateful and I wish you much success in 30 years, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30 more. Because public access is necessary so that people like myself can have a voice. Yes, BronxNet, it's your girl Kat from Kitty Rose. Check me out every Saturday at 11 p.m. right here, Channel 68, The Next Chapter, where we discuss Shades of Grey. Welcome back. 
With a primary goal to serve, connect, and make space for artists in the community, the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council has been a champion for independent artists in New York City since 1973. The organization envisions a New York City where artists and communities engage in dialogue to create a more just, equitable, and sustainable society. President of the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council, Craig Peterson, joins me to discuss the organization. Craig, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Now, I gave a little bit of background about the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council, but can you tell us a little bit more about the work that your organization does? Sure. Uh, our name is a little misleading. We, we're, we've been the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council since the early 70s, and, and we started as a project down in um, the financial district to help revitalize and bring culture uh, to the streets. It was a, you know, the 70s urban blight. Uh, but in the 80s, we became the official arts council for the whole borough of Manhattan. And what that means is uh, we're the arts council that works in uh, partnership with the city and the state to redistribute uh, money and grants to artists and small arts organizations up and down the borough. Every borough has an arts council. The Bronx has, a, has an arts council. Um, and our role is to try to support artists and small arts organizations to do projects annually and for the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council we give away about two million dollars a year in grants to different artists and small arts organizations. Now can you tell us a little bit more about the programs that you have? Sure, I mean that is the backbone of, of our work, our re-granting work, uh, but we also provide artist residencies to artists of all disciplines. Um, we, we actually started as an interesting uh, concept. We kind of thought about empty space and how to put artists into empty space. So in the early years that meant putting art out into the streets for people to enjoy, but also we like to put artists into empty office buildings. So if there's, you know, if there's an empty office space and the landlord is, is willing to give it up for a year and let artists go in and work in those spaces, we put artists in there and develop artist residency programs for them. Um, and so that's a huge part of our work. And then we also provide artist services and uh, in, in the way of um, providing education and uh, you know, financial literacy and professional development opportunities for artists. Now, um, when we say artists, it's a, a large word. It's very <laughs> loaded and it, it could mean so many things. Uh, but because we're in New York City, I could imagine uh, there's so many different types of people, you know, that come to your organization. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the artists that you've worked with? And it doesn't have to be like specific people, just like the overall generalized idea. Sure. Uh, you know, it's really important. I feel it's really important for every borough to have an arts council so that they can really understand their borough. This city changes so fast, you know, and you know, there are new, uh, new, new people moving here every day, new immigrant groups, new, new, new neighborhoods popping up in every borough. Um, and so it's really important for uh, an arts council to be really boots on the ground and understand what are the needs of artists and to be nimble and responsive to what artists need. Um, so uh, it's, in, in that light, it's important for us to really get to know the communities that are out there and be able to, to to reach into them and let them know that these resources are here. Um, and that enables us to, to connect with all different kinds of arts communities, whether they're small local groups in, in Harlem or whether it's a, you know, a, a, a well-known artist who needs a residency for a year. Now I understand, um, and you kind of mentioned it a little bit, that the organization has expanded. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that expansion and how, how it's impacted the work that you do? Sure. Um, you know, we've, as I said, our, our job is really to be as responsive as possible. Uh, and our most recent expansion has been, uh, we, we opened an arts facility on Governor's Island, uh, which is uh, just located off the tip of uh, the bottom of, of Manhattan. Uh, and it's a 40,000 square foot facility where we house artist residencies, we have dance studios, and we also have a gallery space where we present the work of artists. Uh, primarily in the summertime because that's a it's a destination in the summertime but I would say one of the most exciting things about being on Governor's Island right now is that uh, there's a lot of work um, and development around climate change uh, and they're building a very large facility uh, the climate exchange on Governor's Island over the next seven to ten years it's a big city project and Governor's Island is going to be a place where research and activism and advocacy around climate change is really at the forefront of what everybody is working on out there. And what LMCC really wants to do in 
you know, the next five to 10 years is to really situate artists in that conversation and see how artists can contribute to that conversation. Oftentimes we think of climate change as a science problem. Right. We think of art as great story, we artists as great storytellers, as connectors, as people who can really uh, take an issue and bring it to the personal and make people understand that they have a role to play. Uh, and so it's really important for us to make sure that artists play a really powerful role in that community that's developing out on Governor's Island. You know, and I was so excited, you know, and happy to hear that because, as you mentioned, when we talk about a lot of these larger issues that affect people, uh, we think it's maybe like just a social justice thing or a science thing. Um, but it, it's so important uh, to use art as a platform to kind of talk about these issues. And I think it's so amazing that you're helping um, and assisting a lot of artists, you know, while they're on that journey. So that was really exciting to hear. Um, and I can't wait to see, you know, how that will evolve. Um, now, speaking of evolving, uh, your organization has been around since the 1970s, mm. which is a very, very long time, and, and it's such an, an amazing accomplishment for an organization, um, especially, you know, with everything that New York City has gone through over the many, many years. You know, can you talk about how LMCC uh, just has evolved since the 1970s, you know, now that we're in 2024? Yeah, I mean, we've, we've evolved along with the city. Like I said, the city changes really fast, and um, it's becoming very difficult for people to, you know, find affordable housing. It's, uh, my, my biggest concern is people are going to stop coming to New York, especially artists. And, you know, New York has a long history of artists come here because it is New York City. And our goal is to try to figure out how to help artists build sustainable lives. Um, and so that means teaching um, artists how to, you know, do the business of art as well as providing the resources to help them make the art. Um, I think that it's really the role of an arts council to be responsive to the changes that are happening in your community. And that's why I think it's so important that every borough has its own arts council. Now, I want to talk about the 50th anniversary. You know, yeah. how did the organization celebrate that? And congratulations, by the way, because as I mentioned, you know, for an organization to last that long um, and to do amazing work is an accomplishment. Uh, so you could, can you tell us a little bit more about that celebration? Sure. Well, we just had our big... 50th anniversary gala last week, which is why I'm a little hoarse and a little <laughs> tired. Uh, but we're doing, uh, we really wanted to take an opportunity to look back on our work a little bit and celebrate the artists that have come through our program. I mean, we have helped thousands and thousands and thousands of artists over the course of the last five decades. And so we're doing a series of events where we're inviting alumni back uh, to uh, commune with other alumni and do parties, uh, do dance parties, do, uh, we, we, we just recently had a, a party as performance, we called it, uh, a, a DJ named Rochelle Kwan, who is, uh, runs Chinatown Records and has a whole project uh, where she's collected records from, from uh, her neighbors and her family and uh, does listening parties uh, with uh, pop music that's been translated into Mandarin or Cantonese. And, uh, it's it's one way just to celebrate as opposed to thinking about it as a as an exhibit or something that's that's um, uh, stale or, or dull we want to we want to really like bring our communities back into the fold and celebrate the people that we've supported now I want to expand on that a little bit uh, when we think of New York you know as many people say it's a melting <coughs> pot there's so many uh, different people here you know can you talk about how your organization has prioritized <coughs> diversity um, and kind of giving a voice um, and a platform or a canvas to so many of these different types of artists yeah again that's that's about really being boots on the ground and really understanding your borough and how the boroughs are changing uh, you know uh, also as I said New York keeps changing and artists keep getting relocated and moved and pushed into, you know, in the early 70s, tons of artists lived downtown. Now it's not very affordable for artists downtown. A lot of the granting that we do now, um, a, a large por portion of it actually goes to Harlem and Washington Heights because those are the more affordable neighborhoods where artists are able to live. Um, and so it's really important for us to really think about how artists are surviving um, and making sure that we're reaching into communities that um, maybe don't think of themselves as artists, uh, but are creators and are doing projects that are bettering their communities or bringing their communities together. And so oftentimes what we are is the first grant that an artist will get 
uh, it, we're, we're sort of the entry point into people thinking, oh, maybe I can get a little money to do this community-based project at the school or the senior center in my neighborhood. Um, and that helps us to help artists better. And when you're awarding these grants, you know, what are some things the organization looks for? You know, is there, you know, maybe a particular message? Um, you know, is there, you know, specific requirements? Like, what goes into picking somebody uh, to receive this grant? Well, there's very clear guidelines, and we do a whole bunch of, you know, we do information sessions throughout the year leading up to the application process. Uh, we work hard to help people learn how to write grants and learn how to articulate what uh, their project is intended to do. Uh, at, but what we're really looking for is uh, projects that are um, thinking about their communities and the health of their communities and how art can lift their communities in that, uh, in, the, in the effort to improve and, and celebrate the cultures that live there. Now, uh, we talked about, you know, celebrating 50 years. What do you hope to see for the future of the organization in the next 50 years? That's a tough one. I mean, we, as I said, we've, we've taken on this space at Governor's Island and we've developed it um, and we, we're continuing to, to develop programs out there. We talked a little bit about the climate change um, conversation, but what we want to continue to really do is make sure that we are responding to what artists are needing. Um, and that will change from year to year. Uh, and I'm really hopeful that in, in the future, uh, we're able to expand our granting program to, you know, to, to double it, to, to get more money out into the community, artist communities across the borough, and also to work really closely with the city and the state and the other arts councils to make sure we're building a really strong ecosystem for artists to thrive here. I love that. And, and New York City is not just different boroughs. We're, you know, a unit. So I, I love that you said that. Now, if there is um, anything, is there something you'd like to say to an artist out there who may be struggling or not really sure if their art is um, something that they want to put out there or they need the extra support? You know, what is something you would say to them to get them to learn a little bit more about the organization and the way your organization can help? Well, I think, I think it's really important for artists to learn what resources are, are out there. Uh, so, you know, I'm sure you have a big Bronx audience. Go to the Bronx Arts Council's website and learn about the programs that they have. They're an incredible organization. Uh, if you, but if you do live in Manhattan, come to our website. Um, uh, but I think the most important thing is to uh, educate yourself about what opportunities might be out there. But also, take a, take a chance. Take a leap. You know, if you believe in yourself, it's not that hard. You can you can actually get some money to do the work you want to do. All right. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining us and talking about this. Thank you. To learn more about the Lower Manhattan Council, please go to their website at www.lmcc.net. We've come to the end of our show today. I'd like to thank all of our guests for joining us and you, the viewers, for tuning in. If you missed any part of today's show, you can catch the Recable cast at 5 and 10 p.m. on the Optimum Channel 67 and Verizon Files 233, or watch anytime on the web at bronxnet.org. You can catch a brand new episode with Open uh, with Darren Jaime on Wednesday and with Rima Valentine on Friday. I'm Kevin Aline, wishing you and yours safety and wellness now and always. See you next time.